we are conditioned to look outward or look reflect on the past that we don't often really appreciate, accept, or drop into the moment that we're in. And I didn't realize that initially. And it wasn't in my tech career that I was able to give myself that space. I guess I wasn't ready yet. But when I moved to entrepreneurship, that's when kind of my hit my tower card where everything around me started to crumble because I was so unsettled on the inside. And I think for many leaders, you're never going to be able to lead others until you lead yourself. And I think for many of us, we think leadership is not for many of us, but in many situations, leaders are often seen as a power position, which is kind of backwards because leadership is really in an, an empowering position, empowering others. But if you don't feel whole yourself, it's very difficult to empower others because oftentimes you haven't really been able to authentically empower yourself. Welcome to another episode of the Leading to Fulfillment podcast, where everything we talk about is meant to encourage people first leaders, empower individuals to find fulfillment, and to help your organizations become places people love to work. I'm your host, James Laws, and I have a great show in store for you. My guest for this episode is JJ DiGeronimo. JJ shares leadership and inclusion strategies to retain, develop, and advance professional women. Her work is featured in many publications, including Forbes, The Wall Street Journal, and Thrive Global. Uh, she includes these experiences along with her hours of research in her award-winning book, Accelerate Your Impact, which complements her first award-winning book, The Working Woman's GPS. In addition, in addition to her books and keynotes, JJ is a featured columnist and host of the popular podcast, Career Strategies for Women That Work. In my conversation with JJ, we discuss the moving target of fulfillment, how to increase diversity in the hiring process, evolving as a work culture for the betterment of all, and mindfulness and meditation for becoming a better leader. But before we get into all of that, I want to invite you to subscribe and give Leading to, the Leading to Fulfillment podcast a review with your favorite podcast tool. We're over on Apple and Google Podcasts, we're on Spotify, and you can even watch us over on YouTube. And if we are in the place that you like to listen to podcasts, please let me know and I will make sure to fix that. As a bonus, you can head on over to circles.com, that's circles with two eyes, and I and subscribe over to our newsletter. There we let you know when new episodes drop, as well as send you original and curated content on leadership, managing teams, and fulfillment. Now that we have all that business out of the way, let's jump into my conversation with JJ DiGeronimo. JJ, thank you so much for being on the Leading to Fulfillment podcast today. I really appreciate you taking the time. I'm thrilled to be here, James. So to kind of get this started, so everyone who knows who listens to this show uh, recognizes, right, that a lot of what we're doing on this podcast is trying to become better leaders. Uh, we're trying to help leaders discover what it means to be a people first leader, put their team sometimes even not just before themselves, but sometimes before their organizations and thinking about like, how do we actually take care of our company by taking care of our team? And I know that's been a lot in your journey, but to kind of kick it off and so everybody kind of gets to know who you are, could you just take a moment to introduce yourself? Sure, sure. So I've been in the tech industry most of my career and it wasn't until I was close to 40 that I started building some women's groups, working on some DNI initiatives, which really led me to collecting stories of all the things that people use to keep themselves energized, focused, and aligned to their inner compass. And that is really what had catapulted me into writing books, is to really share those stories with other professionals, and especially professional women. And through that work, I started learning more and more about their challenges, their desires, their goals. And women would come to me and say, how do I get promoted? How do I get on a board? Where's the best place to find a sponsor? And so I collected all of these questions throughout my travels, throughout my women's groups and conversations. And that really was the catalyst for my second book, Accelerate Your Impact. And now with even further work on really developing the leader within is really the catalyst for what I'm putting together for my third book. Oh, I love it. Uh, so... 
we know that the you know the the title of the podcast is leading to fulfillment and i feel like we should probably start there when you think about fulfillment you know we've all been on on an airplane most of us anyway uh, have been on an airplane and heard the instructions right especially about the oxygen mask you have to take care of yourself before you take care of someone seated next to you uh, and in fulfillment i think in a lot of ways this works the same way as a leader if you aren't fulfilled if you haven't discovered your path towards fulfillment, it's going to be very hard for you to help your team and the people around you also find fulfillment. So let's start there. How do you, for yourself, interpret fulfillment? Well, that's a great question. And I would have to say that my answer would have been very different a decade ago because I didn't really understand the dynamics of our ego and how that plays into our self-doubt and distracts us from our self-worth. And so if I answered the question a decade ago, I would say things like related to things that I did, accolades I received, positions I landed. But now that I'm in the work and I'm working from the inside out, I really realize that fulfillment and leadership actually starts within, as you talk about in many, many episodes. But it's more than just like, how do I feel inside? It's really about digging into the stories, the feelings, and the energies that are really impacting not only how you feel, but how you make decisions. And I think for many of us, we don't even know how to fulfill ourselves because we're often distracted by these external metrics that we are told in an early age to find our self-worth and how much we like ourselves. Wow. So, you know, there, there's a lot to kind of unpack there. And I'd love to hear about a little bit of this journey. You talk about like how you would answer this 10 years ago. And I can, I can reflect that back to you. Uh, I think that's very true, right? Like the way I saw the world even 20, 10 years ago, 20 years ago is vastly different than how I see it today. I, I, it's, it's, it's amazing for me to even look back and think about the things that I believed about myself, about the world, how different they are today. And, and the world, strangely, hasn't changed all that much, although I think to me it feels like it has. Uh, it's I've changed, my positions have changed, my thoughts have changed. Tell me a little bit about this journey, this, this journey of 10 years where the motivation has gone less outward and gone more inward? So I would have to say that I was really, that my journey accelerated once I decided to pursue entrepreneurship. Now this, I love my job, I love technology, I love the people I work for, but my inner calling was so strong that I felt like I had to really pursue my life's work, which is much of what I'm doing around women, uh, and especially women in the workplace. And in leaving Many of the things that we define ourselves by, which is our role, our salary, you know, who we hang out with, like the companies we work for, when you strip all of those things away, there are many books out there that talk about the nakedness of how you feel when you don't have these external metrics to define not only yourself, but how successful you think you are. And for many entrepreneurs that have jumped into their own space, their own roles, it's a daunting jump. You think you're going to do it for a bigger purpose and more meaning and all of these things. But in the reality, you have to really work from the inside out because you encounter money issues, self-doubt, um, relationship situations that go well beyond the work that you're doing. And I think for many of us, we don't often have to dig through that crap if you have all of these barriers of protection around you. Interesting. I, uh, you know, you talk about a lot of the, the fulfillment that you found in, in your current work, right? Which is centered around a lot of like women in the workplace. Um, and I also run a tech company. You have a huge history, um, a much longer history in tech than I do. And, uh, and, and I think about when I look at how I lead, and, and thinking about what my team needs, I realize, right, like I, a big part of that is me taking a step back and listening to my team and learning from them, learning who they are and what makes them up. And I, I, I'm ashamed to admit it, our team is not as diverse as we want it to be, although we have been working really hard on that. And that has been a huge priority because like all businesses, I, I think I've even said this before in another episode, like, like a lot of businesses, when you start out, it's entrepreneurship. When you get that first hiring, 
you you hire in a in a small like echo chamber, a small circle. And so they end up being a lot of people that look like you because they're they're the people you hang out with on a regular basis. And now if you have a very diverse small echo chamber, that's awesome and you're probably better for it. But if you're not and you didn't have that, your company starts to look pretty monotone pretty flat and it, it's all the same. And so over the years, we've recognized that we've done that and we've needed to change that. And we didn't do it on intentionally, but it does intentions doesn't matter. By accident, we became this kind of monoculture. And so we started to work on this. So years ago, started to work on this and trying to change and flip that script and kind of say like, we don't want to be that way. We know that we would be better if we were more diverse. I wonder, as we're actually in the process of hiring, as I am recording this, maybe not when this goes live, but as I'm recording this, we're actually in the in the throes of hiring a leadership position uh, within our organization. And we want to, especially because it's a leadership position, want to open that up to a more diverse uh a diverse pool of people and hopefully change the dynamic of our own organization. What advice would you give to someone like myself who's maybe right in the midst of the hiring process and trying to say, hey, how do I bring in more women, more uh, people of color, more whatever to, to change the dynamic of their organization? Yes, yes. Well, I love just your viewpoint, the honesty and authenticity of what you've gone through. And oftentimes you're hiring because you just have to get the work done and you're going to leverage people you know that know people that are going to get it done. You're not necessarily even concerned what color or what shape or what size or what they do. You just have to get the work done. And I know everyone that I've worked with, including myself, have been in that at different, at different times in my career. But as you pursue more diverse talent, often you can tap on people in your network that hang out with those people that know those people. So whether it's people on your board, people in your partner community, or people that you work with, letting them know you're putting this role out there and that you're really looking to get diverse thought at the table. So it's one thing to hire diverse people, but really encompassing or empowering diverse thought is critical. Yeah. Second, you really need to look at your job description. Uh, NCWIT, the National Center for Women in Technology, it's a nonprofit funded by many young um, government grants and other funding sources. They do a lot of work for women in tech and women in STEM and really talk through and give you uh, strategies and toolkits and check uh, lists on how to more effectively not only find, hire, but retain diverse talent. And they will tell you that job descriptions and the lengths are critical. So not only do you have to look at all the language you use in a job description, but also the length. Most women often want to be closer to the 100% mark when applying for a job. Men feel comfortable around 60%. So if you have a list of 20 requirements, you're probably going to get mostly men. It's just the way it goes. So what I always say is really create your job description with a summary. Must-haves. Five to seven must-haves. Three to five, if you have done this, we're still we're interested in speaking with you. And, you know, kind of things that would be nice to have after that. So making it more inviting, I think, and it's not because women can't do the work, but oftentimes they have to shift their entire life to change their role. So it's not just about changing their job, they're changing their life. And many women have a lot of built up capital in their existing companies that allow them to freely move to do the other things that are required in their lives. So that's a lot to give up. So it has to be really a good reason to leave. And, you know, so, you know, diverse men don't always have the same challenges. I often focus on women, but it is good to think about how you are writing the job descriptions, what network you're using and what is critical to getting the job done. No, great advice. Uh, shout out to our to my friends over at Underrepresented in Tech. They are helping us actually go through and make sure that we are presenting not a fake image but a true image of what we actually want to be and what we strive to be and what our values are and to reach out to some to to a, a larger variety of people for that purpose. I love I love what you said. You know, it's funny. I I think a lot about the words that we use when we write a job description and trying to hone that in and make sure that it's it is um inclusive and clear and succinct and and work on doing that. I never thought about though you know, necessarily the length of how many of the how many of these responsibilities are, or is this a 
three page job description or a one page job description, uh, which is a very different take than I, I have heard. Now, when hiring, that's one thing. It's one thing to say, all right, we're going to put out the best job description we can possibly put out. We're going to, you know, put out the, you know, the who we really are, but also be honest with what we are trying to accomplish and who we are trying to become. Because to me, that is that is perhaps one of the most important part of hiring is I don't hire to find culture fit. I hire to find culture growth. I'm trying to grow as a culture and not just stay the way we are. I love the way we are, but I still think we can be better. And so I think a, a diverse uh, workforce helps us be better versions of ourselves. Now, the question I have, and this I'll, I'll throw this to you specifically in, in where your focus is, which is on women. Uh, it's one thing to put out the application, to get the job description, to get the diverse applicants in. It's another thing that once they're in your organization to be a place that is safe, and to be a place that is a place where everyone can thrive, uh, what do you find the struggles are for women in organizations in the workplace that they're dealing with? Well, generally, when you have been a culture of similar people, um, it's hard because you don't even realize the dynamics that you've been creating for the culture in which you exist. And so there's many cultures I've been to that, you know, their favorite thing to do is to throw darts and drink beer and they do it every Thursday night. And it is a huge piece of their culture. Uh, and so I think sometimes just sort of thinking about what have you been doing for a long time? What defines your culture? what will be engaging or um, a way to engage people in new ways. So maybe you can still keep doing that, but maybe you don't do it every Thursday, or maybe you do something on Tuesdays, or maybe you do something in the mornings. It doesn't really matter. I just think you, like kind of what got you there might not get you where you want to go next. And just thinking about the behaviors, mannerisms, connections, the way you interact, the way you get together, the way you have fun together, you know, what does that look like? And is that such a close net group of people? Is there room for other people to feel like they can be part of it? No, I, that's great advice. You know, it's although I feel a little um, exposed because four years ago, you just described kind of a regular afternoon uh, at the company when we were co-located, it was darts and beer. Like that was a very common thing that happened. And I as we've tried to change, I've noticed that I've myself have even become more uncomfortable with, you know, I think what happens a lot in tech is this kind of bro culture. And what has, what I noticed was we just came back from our annual retreat. Uh, we had just gone distributed fully in 2019 and COVID happened and we didn't end up having our retreat and it'd been a couple of years. We finally got to the point where we felt safe enough to throw our company retreat. We got it together and we hired someone to cater our meals uh, and come in and sh a chef uh, and got a little more than we bargained for. Uh, this, this chef brought a sound system and was going to entertain and do all this stuff. We just thought they were bringing food. Um, but I noticed that he, that this particular individual was making jokes that were, uh, very bro culture, very misogynistic, very just uncomfortable. And they were making me uncomfortable. And the rest, I think the rest of the team just kind of like laughed it off and was fine. But I felt very uncomfortable by it. And I, I was, and I realized it was because I feel like that's what we were and that's not who we are and who we were trying to be. But I also looked if, if I were this caterer coming into this company and I saw the team, we we were definitely heavy on guys that, over women, and so uh, yeah, I, he he probably thought he was pandering to the crowd, although he wasn't, and so it was a very uncomfortable situation. And I wonder what are some practices other than yes, we have to think differently, but what are some actual practical like if somebody's listening today and they're like, yeah, I found myself stuck in this culture. I have also found myself trapped in a culture that is perhaps. Uh, set in their ways. It's the way we've always done it. But the team is changing. The dynamics are changing. The workforce is changing. Uh, and so because of that, we have to change and adapt with it. What are some practical, uh, maybe actionable things you might encourage a, a business leader 
to consider uh, in their organizations? Well, first, I just want to really compliment you on your evolution, because I really think that leaders and leadership is about empowering the people around you. That is what leadership is. And so the fact that you even recognize that, hey, this doesn't feel so good anymore means you've evolved and it's likely that the people on your teams are are evolving with you too, even if it might not be as evident as uh, it may look from the outside. So that's great news. I think the other thing is just, you know, the idea of these events and activities is to get some camaraderie, to enhance the culture and allow people to feel comfortable to work together in good and bad times. And so I think just assessing kind of, is it working? Is what you're doing working? Are some people just traditionally not showing up? Uh, Are there subgroups? You know, do you have clicks? Are there subgroups? Are there ways that you can start to break this up a little bit by introducing new ways of getting together? You know, if everyone plays bocce ball or everybody eats these, like we, I used to join a company where eating this super duper hot burger was like the induction, you know, and it was great initially, but it didn't work for that long after we got about 50 people. And it's just kind of like assessing and looking to see, because ideally as a leader, you're trying to get the most out of the people you've hired and in a way that makes sense and that they're excited about too. And I think in tech, it's hard sometimes to be a leader because the pace is ridiculous and everything is like A++ in regards to when it needs to get done. Like this has to be done like right now, this minute, every minute. And it's hard to lead when everything has the same priority. And so the leadership role in these tech companies is really deciding what is yes right now, because there's not as much staff, there's not as many people leading in these companies and wanting to join these companies. And you can't burn your staff and team out. You just can't. So as a leader deciding what to focus on when is one of your most instrumental roles. That is something that I had been feeling over the last few years, uh, especially the pressure and the energy, right, of how fast we feel like we always have to go and how I could see it burning out myself and my team members. And we, one of the things that we started to do really is say, why? Why do we have to go so fast? What are our goals? What what does success look for like for us? And if we redefine success, can we also redefine the culture of how we work? So to those listening, if you are in the tech business and maybe you feel you're caught in that trap of like it's 120 miles per hour all the time, everything is important, everything is urgent, everything's got to get done, I would really encourage you to ask why. Like why? Because I what I've started to realize now is our now if you if you were to actually look at our calendar for our year, uh, we probably spend thirty to forty percent of that off, not on projects, not on work, not doing you know what we call intermissions. It's it's breaks, it's breathing time, it's just slow down. Like we're not in that big of a hurry, honestly. Because one ultimately, what my goal is right is that the people that work for me continue to be able to work for me and have fulfilling lives, both in their work and in their personal lives and in their families and all the things that they choose to do. So I want all of that to be integrated together as much as possible. Uh, and I know that working them to the bone doesn't solve that problem for anyone. And it doesn't actually make you, it, it, it doesn't actually guarantee your success either. What does guarantee your success though, is a b- group of people who love the company, who love what they do, who believe it matters and see the impact that their work has and know that when they leave at the end of the day, they're not depleted, but they're filled and they're excited to spend time doing other things and know that they will have the energy to come back to work the next day and not dread doing it. So my, my whole mission is to get rid of case of the Mondays and excited about the weekend and that those things are great. I mean, they're there, right? But you should be able to have a great weekend on Wednesday if that's what you need to rejuvenate you and to get you excited about your work. I want to I wanna shift. I want to come back to that fulfillment conversation because you have a coaching course that, you are released, that you've released called The 10 Lessons I Gained from My Mindfulness. And I love the concept of mindfulness. I love the idea of slowing down. That's kind of, this is my rough segue. 
uh, our whole our whole schedule. I told everyone in my company. I've said this on the podcast a number of times. Every single person that we hire is paid to think. They're not just paid to do stuff. They're paid to think. And if they're not thinking, then we're not getting the most that we can uh, for the organization and for the health of the company. But part of that thinking is slowing down and spending time inside and being mindful and being present. Uh, and I want to hear a little bit about your journey towards mindfulness. Well, first, I just want to comment that I don't think you'll have any problem finding people to join your team. You are amazing in the way that you approach your company, how you feel about your employees, the culture you're creating to really fuel the people that make your business possible. And I know this is what people are looking for. They don't want to be a number. They don't want to be executing every single day on 16 things. <laughs> they want meaning. They want purpose. They want alignment. And they want to do good work. And I feel like probably this podcast has been very helpful. But the other things you're doing have really round you out as a leader that will attract the energy of the people that will appreciate what you're creating. So congratulations there for sure. I appreciate that. You know, mindfulness is part of that too. It's about giving yourself space to recognize what your thoughts are. And I think for many of us, when we are so busy doing all the time, we can easily live in the future of what we need to get done or reflect on the past of what has already happened. And for many of us, we are very rarely in the present moment. And the present moment is where often you experience more joy and more excitement about life because you're actually in the moments you're creating. But unfortunately, the way society has molded us, we are so busy trying to get there, wherever there may be, that we never really have the space, as you mentioned, to appreciate where we are right now. And everything that's happening is right happening in the moment you're in. That's it. That's what life is about. But we are conditioned to look outward or look reflect on the past that we don't often really appreciate, accept, or drop into the moment that we're in. And I didn't realize that initially. And it wasn't in my tech career that I was able to give myself that space. I guess I wasn't ready yet. But when I moved to entrepreneurship, that's when kind of my hit my tower card where everything around me started to crumble because I was so unsettled on the inside. And I think for many leaders, you're never going to be able to lead others until you lead yourself. And I think for many of us, we think leadership is not for many of us, but in many situations, leaders are often seen as a power position, which is kind of backwards because leadership is really in an, an empowering position, empowering others. But if you don't feel whole yourself, it's very difficult to empower others because oftentimes you haven't really been able to authentically empower yourself. And so mindfulness is a tool that really gives you the ability to see what you say to yourself all the time, where you spend your time. Is it in the past? Is it in the future? What are you saying to yourself on a regular basis? And are you able to really center into where you are right now? Because when you really teach yourself to do that, you have a lot more appreciation for not only who you are, but who other people are too. One of the practices that I have over the years slowly started to integrate more into my life is this idea of meditation and and mindfulness meditation and this idea of just being present in the moment and letting the thoughts kind of come, note them, let them pass through and not, not worry about what it is or what it isn't. And just, it is like, it just is. And just be in that moment. And I found that for me as a, as a business leader and as somebody honestly, who is a idea person who generates a lot of ideas, sometimes to the to the detriment of my company and my team, uh, generates a lot of ideas, that, that that time of mindfulness, that time of just the pause, or what I, I like to call my scheduled boredom, where I just, I schedule it to do nothing. I have nothing to do. And there's nothing to do but sit and just be in that moment, is a huge... Um, 
it's a huge moment of clarity where things start to untangle themselves because there is no agenda. There is no output that I'm seeking from it. And sometimes when you let go of the need for the output, the need for the outcome or the objective, uh, things start to unravel a little bit better and cl- and get cleaner and better understood. What are some of your recommendations to leaders listening who are perhaps looking to start a mindfulness practice of their own and or, or never maybe are just hearing about it and like I don't even know what this mindfulness is how would somebody get started doing something like this yeah I mean there's usually a compelling event you're tired you're exhausted you're overworked you're depleted you're depressed I mean something is happening and you're like this is not working for me Mindfulness, um, designed by John Kabat-Zinn, is really just being mindful of your thoughts. So what are you telling yourself all the time when you get a new idea, when you finish a project, you start something new? What are you saying to yourself on a regular basis? I believe mindfulness is a critical piece of meditation because I did not realize that when you meditate, you're still going to have thoughts. Those thoughts don't just all disappear because you're meditating. And, you know, when you're meditating, you're really not creating lists of things you should be doing. The idea is, is that you're mindful of the thoughts that pass. But as soon as they come in, just saying, I see you and letting them pass by. If you hold on to any one thought and then start dissecting it, designing it, organizing it, listing it, you, you're not meditating. You're planning, you're brainstorming, you're working. And so I think really recognizing that meditation is a practice to not hold on to any one thought. And for me, that was a lesson that took me years to learn because I had been molded to believe that my self-worth came based on my output, my actions, the things I got done. And when I tried to start meditation, I started thinking, I started doing, I started creating, which was gone, which is how I was essentially taught to be successful and like myself. And so I had to unravel all of that mind chatter and self-defined stories to really allow myself the space to be quiet, to be bored, to let the ideas come and go. And I think that that is a big exercise of self-compassion and self-love that takes years to get to. Absolutely. And I'm not even close. But I would say to those listening, it's also a great tool, right? Like I agree, right? There is a separation of spending time in meditation and not holding on to the thought and not turning it into a work session, like an ideation session. Um, But it's also a great precursor into an ideation session. If you're wanting to solve a problem, mindfulness and meditation at the beginning of that process can be a great way to prepare yourself for great and more meaningful and more clarity in those ideas as you start to develop that. Would you agree with that? Well, let me just expand on why you want to do this. And to your point that you've already touched on already is you're creating space for the ideas to flow. And I think my biggest awakening is that I don't have to do it alone. I don't have to figure everything out by myself. By creating space allows for channels for things, for uh, intuition, ideas, innovation to come through me. And I think that is really the gift that comes out of it is now you are a channel to bring things in that you might not think of on your own. That's yeah, absolutely. I know we're a little crunched for time. And so I want to, and I feel like we could talk for hours uh, about a whole number of issues. So I hope you'll agree to come back on the show as a, as a follow up in the future. But for those who uh, really enjoyed what you had to say and want to learn more about you and find you and, and maybe perhaps a little bit more about your course, uh, I want to give you the final word. Oh, thank you so much. Well, I'm easy to find. I'm JJ DiGeronimo. LinkedIn is obviously my favorite platform, Uh, but you can also find me on my website. Most of the resources are there and most of them are free. So if you're interested in um, picking up any of those, they are available to you. And if you're looking to inspire your women's groups or ERG groups, I spend a lot of time on the roads with those groups, really helping them accelerate 
their impact and their desires. So I look forward to joining many more as we continue to come out of, you know, the lockdown. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're going to put links to everything in the show notes so that everybody can get in touch with you. JJ, thank you so much for being on the show today and just giving us even a, a snippet of some of the, the wealth of experience that you've had on your journey. And again, I hope you'll join us in the future. Oh, thank you so much. This was really enjoyable. Thanks for the time and the invite. Bye-bye. What a fantastic conversation and a big thank you to JJ DiGeronimo for joining me on this episode. Everything we mentioned, including a full transcript of the show, is available over on our website and you can access it anytime by visiting leadingtofulfillment.com slash zero two one. I want to share how we built the kind of company people love to work for at my company, Saturday Drive. Uh, I hope these... Uh, Strategies will be useful to some of you uh, in your current and future endeavors. You know, nothing would make me happier than knowing that Saturday Drive is a catalyst for the creation of more people forward fulfilling companies. So let's talk about them. One, we defined core values with our team in mind, we prioritized fulfillment and we focused on progress over productivity or activity. We rejected work-life balance in favor of work-life integration, and we offered benefits that actually benefit our team. So what kind of leader do you want to be? Do you want to lead a team that shows up out of obligation, ready to slog through the day and simply tolerate their jobs? I can't think of anything worse. No, you want a team fueled by passion, a team that finds their work fulfilling and strives for progress, a team that loves the work that they do and a, the company that they do it for. Not only is that a huge benefit for them, but it also makes your company better as a whole. You get back what you give. This is true in every area of life, but business leaders tend to forget it. They become takers, draining their employees dry without giving back. Then they wonder why the work is subpar or why they keep losing great people. I want to challenge you to give. Give your employees the tools and guidance they need to flourish and find fulfillment. When you do, you'll have built the kind of company where people love to work. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join me on the next episode. And Until then, may your businesses be successful as you lead your teams to fulfillment.